test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Today is Wednesday, August 19th. I'm Donna Will, Professional Development Coordinator for the Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to the Maryland Community of Practice for Supporting Families webinar series. This is webinar number seven, Reopening, Things to Consider. The session is being facilitated by Mary Ann Kane Bresci, Director of Family Supports for the DDA. Our panelists for today are Bernie Simons, DDA Deputy Secretary, Nicholas Burton, Director of Central Maryland Regional Office, Sean Cross, CEO at the ARC Central, excuse me, the ARC Northern Central Chesapeake Region, and Kimberly Marchman, a parent of a young woman currently served through the ARC of Northern Chesapeake Region. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. There are two options for listening to the webcast, that's by computer or smartphone. And there's a handout for this webinar, and they will be emailed um, in a little bit. And um, I probably will upload those um, in the webinar panel in just a few minutes. Um, we are recording the webinar, and at the end, we'll take questions that are directly related to the webinar. If you have any questions regarding services and supports, please contact your local regional office. If you have questions related to Appendix K, please submit them to dda.toolkitinfo at maryland.gov. In addition, we're interested in highlighting how people with disabilities and their families are supporting and caring for one another during this pandemic throughout this webinar series. If you're interested in sharing your story, please contact Mary Ann Kane Bresci directly at mary.kane-bresci at maryland.gov or me, Donna Will, at maryland.gov. And now I'd like to introduce Mary Ann Kane Bresci. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of the Maryland Community of Practice for Supporting Families to our webinar titled Reopening Things to Consider. The purpose of this series um, for supporting families is to bring people with intellectual and developmental disabilities along with their families, however defined, and others together. Our goal is to connect with one another, share important information and ideas, all in an effort to learn from each other so that we might support each other, build resiliency within ourselves, our families, and the community at large um, as we find our way through, through this pandemic and, and beyond. Throughout this series, we've discussed and addressed a variety of topics and concerns with which individuals and families have faced and are facing related to COVID-19 and every li everyday life in general. We've done this through the lens of charting the life course framework and with the help of our invited guests and subject matter experts. And today is no different. Okay, this is always happens. Hold just one moment, please. Excuse me. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that, my first glitch. Charting the life course um, framework charges us to support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families to lead their best lives fully integrated in the communities. And, and we can do this in a myriad of ways. Today, we're going to do this by having this conversation, hearing from experts and families alike, again, all in an effort to share the information and learn from one another so that all of us, but in particular, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and families can make the best decisions for their lives, given the realities of this time, particularly as it pertains to reopening or re-entering society. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce, I'd like to introduce our esteemed guest. We are so fortunate to have um, Bernard Simons, known as Bernie, our Deputy Secretary at DDA, along with Nicholas Burton, known as Nick, our, our um, Central Regional Director, um, along with Sean Cross, who is the CEO of the ARC Northern Chesapeake Region, and Kimberly Marchman, a parent. We um, thank all of you for being here, for sharing your time, experience, and expertise with us today. I'd like to, with that, if Bernie, let's get started. And if you'll 
be get open. Um, I'm sorry. Let's begin with some opening remarks from um, Bernie, and um, welcome, Bernie. Oh, well, thank you, uh, Mary Ann. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, Nick and uh, Sean and uh, Kim as we talk about uh, reopening. Um, I know that this pandemic has obviously been going on since March, and and um, I think there's a lot of concern about uh, reopening. Um, I think the governor has been extremely um, thoughtful in everything he has done and the advice of the committees that are advising him about reopening with uh, different stages uh, as we uh, continue to deal with um, uncertainty about uh, what this is going to look like as time goes on and, you know, people being isolated and depressed and frustrated and, you know, people just wondering when is this ever going to get over. And so um, we know that when we first started uh, with the pandemic and the governor declared the emergency, that uh, a lot of our day services closed because they were congregate. Um, and people who were even employed, uh, some of those uh, companies, uh, whether they be restaurants and or whatever, uh, were, were closed. And so we had a lot of people therefore either living at home with their families or in their uh, residential sites. So we have about 18,000 people in supports and services and about 6,500 of those people are in some type of residential services. And we knew that there was a challenge with what type of supports we were gonna do uh, for people um, because they were basically quote unquote sheltered in place. And so uh, we had the opportunity to work with uh, Medicaid and uh, submit what they call an Appendix K to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which allowed us to change our service delivery system so that people with our uh, waivers basically would say you need to be in a day service. Um, it doesn't look like a day service if you're doing that in a residential home. And so obviously we changed things. We've done a lot of things remotely. And I think that people are um, having conversations about what is meaningful day services look like. And I know that each regional director has had uh, these conversations at least three, four or five times with the providers within their region. And I'm going to stress region because if you look at the numbers of people who have tested positive uh, for COVID and those who have been isolated, uh, basically the numbers in the west and in the east are a lot lower for the general population and for our population than it is in uh, the central region or, or the southern region. And so as we continue to uh, talk about this, uh, we've been fortunate to be able to provide some guidance as well as um, personal protective equipment to uh, and cleaning supplies to individuals and families, uh, et cetera. We also have been working with the um, housing and community development department um, and uh, it's gone out there's been multiple email blasts that there was some concerns that a lot of individuals who are either self-directing or families or providers um, when this pandemic started there was a shortage of uh, PPE and uh, obviously they were looking to purchase this um, we've made uh, with behavioral health in the Department of Disabilities and the Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, $10 million available to reimburse uh, people who apply online. Um, that application, uh, I think, is good at, until uh, another few weeks, and we will continue to take a look at that. So again, it's for PPE and uh, cleaning supplies, et cetera. Last week, we had the opportunity to send out a meaningful day services framework. Um, and that was reviewed by three of our department uh, epidemiologists, uh, who also looked at uh, this as, uh, you know, are we giving good guidance? What does it look like uh, for the CDC interpretations uh, as related to our uh, group homes and as we continue to reopen a little bit? There's also a link in that document to the state DD directors, which is NASDDS, reopening support and guidelines. 
And there's also another document that's really good. It's from the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. And it's a white paper for considerations that uh, people should take in thinking about reopening. I just want to stress, as I've been saying this over and over and over again, um, we are in no rush to reopen. Not at all. We need to do this very thoughtfully. We need to be very, very careful. We need to make sure that we've got uh, an, enough uh, PPE. Obviously, if people are uh, in their home, they may not be PPE, but if they go out, they'll need face masks, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I've been happy to hear from individuals, from family members, and from uh, providers about what your concerns are and again, I want to thank you for being involved in advocating as we continue to create a flexible, person-centered, family-oriented system so that people can have full lives. And with that, uh, I'll finish my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. And with that, I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the screen and um, to remind you that if you haven't already, participated or, or completed the DDA Participant and Family Survey, we would love for you to do so. Um, you'll have this in your, your handouts um, when Donna sends them out to you. Again, thank you, Bernie. And now I, I would like to welcome Nick from the Central Region. We've asked Nick to set the stage, if you will, to talk about what he and his staff have been doing at the regional office to better to, 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 to support providers, families, and individuals as we begin, as we consider reopening and re-entering um, the community. So with that, Nick, welcome. Thanks, Mary, Mary Ann. Uh, I appreciate the invite to come here and talk today about what the Central Region's been doing. So as Mary Ann said, my name is Nick Burton. I'm the Regional Director for the Central Region. Um, and just some context about our kind of reopening efforts. We had this, our region had our reopening work group on Monday, June 15th, um, and we had robust participation from CCS agencies and some family members. And I think it, it, it started off a really great conversation about um, kind of how do we move forward? It started off a good conversation about those, those immediate considerations that needed to be made. And it also produced some more questions that needed to be answered. And I think, you know, as Bernie said, there's been some guidance that's since been issued. Um, and I think that it was important for those regional, regional teams to be having those conversations with each other so that we could get that information out and up to headquarters so that we could get some of that, um, that state specific guidance out the door. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, Nick, I've got a couple of questions for you if you don't mind. What were okay. the guiding what were the guiding principles the regional office used to help facilitate the reopening conversations that you had? Yeah. So I think you know we kind of started from kind of an obvious place, safety. Um, and when we were having a conversation about reopening in the middle of a pandemic, we wanted to make sure that safety was at the forefront of that conversation. The other guiding principles that we used are, you can see are, are ones that have evident and are put into that a, a guidance that's actually gone out across the state, but we talked about innovation, right? So how in a safe manner can providers and teams talk about innovative ways to ensure service delivery? We talked about collaboration. We understand that in this kind of unprecedented time, there's more need for collaboration amongst providers, amongst teams, amongst systems, amongst families, amongst all of us to really ensure that um, people are going back safely, but then also people are having robust conversations about what that looks like safely. Um, we also had um, conversations and uh, around data. You know, what is the data? What's data telling us? What's data at the local level telling us about how many cases there are? What is data telling us about 
uh, an agency's ability to reopen? What's the data on how much PPE we have and how much we're using? So I think data was a really important conversation to make, to make sure that we had the right data and that data was being used to be able to make safe decisions. I think there was also a conversation around capacity. What does capacity look like? You know, you talk about capacity not only in the sense of a day program and the capacity to bring people back, but you also kind of have to look at that capacity of, of the people that we support, the capacity of families. You know, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of change happening um, in the backdrop of life just in general. And so what are people's capacity to have these conversations? What is the capacity to continue to bring people back? What's the capacity to um, safely reopen? And I think also we just had a conversation about equity. I think, you know, we've seen that this pandemic has created some inequities across our country. And so how do we ensure that in an effort to reopen, we're understanding individual need and how are we meeting those individual needs as, as a system, we look at reopening. Thank you. You know, <clears throat> when I think about capacity and collaboration, can you talk for a moment about why it's so important to include the person-centered planning teams um, just for a moment? Yeah. I think our system, as, as just as a system, the, the, the Individuals with Disability IDD system has been built around this idea of collaboration and meeting together to meet the needs of the people that we all have come together to support. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, to understand that we're all coming to the table with rich histories, we're coming to the table with backgrounds, we all come to the table with knowledge and it only benefits the conversation and helps the person achieve the life that they wanna live. Um, you know, I think it's a particularly important to ensure that families are a part of those conversations and that individuals are a part of that conversation, right? It's their life and those families have been, you know, families that have been with people for, for forever. They understand kind of what happens when there's not a paid caregiver there. They, under, they understand kind of what it means to their son or daughter from the perspective of a mom and a dad. And that perspective, other people aren't gonna be able to have. And then similarly, you have agencies and you have CCS workers who come to the table with a knowledge and experience base that's really important as well. And when you put all that together, you've got such a dynamic group of people that can really help the individual meet the needs and the wants that they have for their life. And I think in the, in the context of this conversation, there can be a really good conversation about what does this person need to safely reintegrate back into society or a day program given their unique needs and given the pandemic and health recommendations in general. Absolutely. Yeah. And from my perspective, to, for me, when you bring everyone to the table and you have everyone has the opportunity to be a part of the conversation, it's during those conversations to identify the challenges. But again, if people are free and, and, and to talk about, it's an opportunity to really think about other resources that might be available. You really do build out the capacity to better support this person. Um, that makes complete sense to me. So given all that you've said, um, and you talked about some of the, the principles, what, what would you say has been the, the, the most important principle that you've had to consider um, when in these conversations around the opening? What's, what's been the number one? Yeah, I, I think it doesn't matter if I'm talking to my colleagues, I'm talking to an agency, I'm talking to a parent, I'm talking to an individual. The, the predominant conversation when we're having, when we're talking is about safety. How yeah. do we ensure the safety of people? 
And I think we all think about that just in our everyday lives. Like, is it worth going to Target for the second or third time this week? Do I need to run out here? Should, you know, yeah. where, should I wear a mask and a face covering, right? I think safety has become a critical piece of a lot of decisions and a lot of conversations we're having. And I don't think that that, that changes when we're talking about how do we safely reopen? How do we reintegrate into our society? Safety has to be at the core of that um, conversation, including those other principles, but it really is rooted, I think, in safety. Thank you. So, so how is the region supporting reopening efforts on the part of, of providers and, and supporting families? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the biggest thing that I've seen our regions be doing doing is facilitating our the regional reopening meetings. Um, I think the other thing that's been helpful is the technical assistance we're providing, um, particularly when there's individuals who are positive, who have become positive, kind of mm -hmm. helping navigate what that looks like in terms of testing, in terms of quarantine, in terms of collaboration with public health departments, in terms of collaboration with the uh, Maryland Department of Health. Um, and I would, I have to say our partners in this have been, have been extremely collaborative, that when we need to get on a phone call and have a conversation, um, they're there, they're able to participate, we get the right information so that everybody's on the same page. I think when I speak with family members, a lot of the conversations I'm having is just clarification. And I think, you know, you'll what I've noticed is I would get a lot of calls where they want to confirm. They just want to make sure what they heard was right, or they want to make sure that this is the right thing, or that this is, is the direction, or this is what the CDC was saying. And so I yeah. think it's just a lot of confirmation. And I think that speaks to just the uncertainty out there of, 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 of what this all means, right? We're in the middle of a pandemic. It's new. It's novel. And I think just the region being able there to be able to help families and help individuals and provide some of that reassurance around some of that. And I think one of the I think one of the things that I'm really proud of that we've also been doing is the amount of PPE that we've been able to distribute to um, individuals living with their families or on their own, um, particularly in the self-directed program, providing the PPE to agencies. Um, you know, when there's an outbreak, we're, we're, we immediately reach out to an agency to offer additional PPE to make sure they've got what they need. Um, and I know that my staff have also, you know, in a time where we're all wondering what we can do and how can we can help, I know that my staff have really appreciated the opportunities to be able to talk with providers and meet with providers and families and pass out that PPE and, and in some way, small way, help out in that situation. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me ask you this, um, technology. What, how has technology um, supported your efforts in, in, in working with providers um, and families towards its reopening effort? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that when we talked a little bit about one of the principles earlier I was talking about was innovation. And I think, you know, when you talk about also um, having to rethink how we do business and how to rethink how to provide services during this time, I have been blown away by the innovation from our providers and families and teams in considering how they use technology to help meet people's needs, whether it be around social stories, whether it be around remote supports that are being provided, right? And I know remote supports don't meet the needs of everybody, but they, they are meeting the needs of some, and it's really it's a really cool opportunity for those, um, for some individuals. So it's worth kind of having the conversation. I think also just in general as a system, it's really important for us to 
use technology and consider how we can use technology um, just as an everyday way of life and to build that into what we're doing, not only to talk about reopening, but just building the skills for people to utilize technology, which we know helps with communication, which we know helps with behavior management, um, which we know helps with um, creating and teaching independent skills. So I think that it's been really cool seeing providers take that technology and work with families and teams to make it the most useful for the people that they're supporting. I think it's really cool. It absolutely is. And um, I have seen with families, the, the, you know, young men and women or men and women being served in the waiver who may not have had the, the not had not recognized the need for assistive technology, but the pandemic certainly has brought light to that and 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 how they're rethinking and and for families to, to realize that in fact this is something that needs to be a part of their lives and going forward. So absolutely. Well how about transportation? Um, can you talk a little bit about that and what that yeah. might look like for folks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I you know I think I think regardless of where you live, whether you're rural, whether you're urban, um, if you need to get out into your community, you are talking about transportation. And I think when you look at a pandemic where transportation has been um, has been limited, you and you look at transportation from a safety piece, um, where you know, how safe is it to get on public transportation? When you look at it for families who are trying to negotiate what they've got going on during a day in terms of, you know, work is continuing, but I have all my children at home, how do I get people from to and to and from places, right? Yeah. Transportation yeah. is going to be a conversation that has to be had. And I think yeah. when we talk about reopening and we talk about, um, agencies and we talk about capacity and we talk about innovation this is where i this is where these conversations really have got to live with teams and i think teams need to be at the forefront of how are we having a conversation around transportation what are the needs what does it look like for my loved one to ensure they have the transportation they need in a safe manner to be able to access the services that are critical to them so that they can live a full life in their community. And so I think it's just really important to make sure that those transportation conversations are happening and they're happening up at the at the at the forefront of these conversations. Absolutely. Nick, I've got one final question for you. Um, what resources are guiding the reopening conversations across the state? Can you speak to that for just a brief moment? Yeah, I think, and I think Bernie spoke to this too. I think, you know, we're provided some guidance and we provided um, some links to local and national organizations. I think, you know, regionally specific. And I think as a DDA specific in our system, you know, we're really depending on the health experts. Um, you know, we said from the beginning, this is about safety, right? The CDC, the Maryland Department of Health, We've been collaborating with Dr. Fetter, who's an epidemiologist with the Maryland Department of Health. I think it's really important to understand and for everyone when we're having these conversations to know that science, science matters right now, right? The facts matter. Um, we are, we, we want to make sure that with what we're doing and what we're encouraging is in alignment with with health experts and that the guidance that we're providing is alignment in that, with that as well. And I think leaning on each other and those resources to be able to collaborate to help these efforts and help these conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Your, the information you shared with us today, from my perspective, has been informative and, and provocative, particularly around the teams and working together and, um, and building off and sharing resources with one another. Just, just so thank you very much. Sorry. With that, I'd like to go. Bernie, did you have something to say? No? 
Okay. With that, I'd like to invite uh, welcome Sean Cross. Sean is the CEO, the CEO of the ARC Northern Central Northern Central Region. Um, she is so gracious to to share her time with us today, and she's going to talk about how the ARC has approached reopen, reopening. Welcome, Sean. Thanks, Marianne. So, Thanks for having me today. Yeah, so I'd like to start off. Um, I have a question for you. What does reopening mean to you or the ARC? So, you know, kind of like all the rest of us, our lives kind of changed March 9th, that week of March 9th, all the way through as we were trying, as we were gathering information and trying to figure out, you know, what was happening. And so, you know, at that time, it was really about kind of closing down, right? Shutting everything down. And um, so once we got through all those safety protocols and making those things happen, and then we had a time to kind of sit back and reflect. And there was a lot of, I don't knows. Um, in fact, that kind of became a common line of ours. Like, what do, what do you think we should do? Like, I don't know. And then um, we decided to come up with something a little more proactive. And it was kind of like, let's take this opportunity to kind of reset and reimagine um, and, you know, kind of try to figure out how to become, I mean, we consider ourselves to be pretty person centered, but it's like really taking those charting the life course principles and making those things happen. So we use the term reset, reimagine, and that is um, where um, we are in regards to reopening. So, and, and would you, in, in one way, would you say that um, you never really closed and, and begin to talk about yeah. that a little bit? Yes, yeah, so from this slide, you can see that we, we really never closed. Um, our employment program, um, it you know, had a significant impact. A lot of employers were um, telling people not to come into work. Um, but we did have over 30 people who were considered essential employees at the time. So we used informed decision making to work with um, the people who were working and their families to make sure that this was the right decision for them. So 30 over 30 people decided to continue to work. The program that was impacted the most was our um, our community-based day program because it's a program that has a number of people that we provide supports to across the county. So transportation, as Nick was saying, um, you know that had to stop, and so it that ended um, effectively um, immediately. And then what else happened is our residential, our community living program it was 24 seven. And so that continued to um, operate and team members from our day program moved over there. We did have um, conversations with everybody whose family was involved and some families chose to um, take their son or daughter home with them um, for at least a period of time. Everybody's back, so um, in their home. But at that time, those were the decisions that we were making. And then our personal supports, um, most of our personal supports, are, they take place in the community. And it, we have a handful of people we support 24 seven or essential personal supports, and those continued um, during this time. And then as you can see, my family support services. So we're an ARC, we support people across the arc of their life from birth till the end. And that program just continued to actually get busier as far as the number of calls that were coming in and the number of resources, because um, schools were being impacted, families, um, and then also just supports in general. They were getting a lot of calls. You can see my team member numbers went down a little bit because schools closed, so people had to stay home, some people had to stay home, or some people had underlying health conditions that they weren't able to continue working. Okay, thank you. Sean, um, taking into account the current guidances, um, guidance policies and practices, when do you think the ARC might begin to reopen the Meaningful Day Services Program? So we we actually started that, um, and we are looking at meaningful the, the framework that um, DDA has sent out. We had started doing that before we received that guidance, but we're working through that. So what? Um, what we did is we we our case management team we have an internal case management team that connects with all of our families and they make decisions so we're connecting with them all during this time saying you know do you need us you know what's happening and um some families honestly we're saying you know until there's a vaccine we're good we got it mm -hmm. um and other families were saying we need you now we needed you yesterday we need to figure something out um so we just took 
each individual person and kind of prioritized them based on their needs. And um, so a lot of our, the people who received one-to-one, -one, some of those started getting those one-to-one -one supports a little earlier than some of the small groups. And then we looked at um, the safety. You know, can people physically distance? Are they able to wear a mask? And do they want to get out for an hour or two? Um, and then also some individuals were not utilizing virtual supports. It just wasn't okay for them. That wasn't working for them. We have about 30 people on average a day who take advantage of the virtual supports and it, it's meaningful to them. Like some people have 100% attendance. They will not miss a day. Um, but those are the things that we take into consideration. Of course, CDC, DDA, health department guidelines. So you, you've mentioned earlier, you've talked about the different kinds of services you provide, residential, day, employment, personal support, so forth and so on. What, um, how are the concerns the same but different between residential and day and employment services for you as you think about reopening? That's a, I mean, that's an interesting question. So day, I mean, every, the same is that we focus on safety first, right? Everything has to be done. So um, for employment, um, it's the safety comes in, is the person able to physically distance, wear a mask, can they um, utilize transportation um, in a safe manner and um, forming the supports around there. Residentially, um, we have people who live in, the, in their home um, in the residential services and they're still working, right? So that right. was interesting because we have team members coming in and out, right? So they're coming in and out because of their work. And so they, um, we actually made the decision that they would operate in the same safe practices that our team members were. So if they were working outside of the home, they, when they came in and they were in the common areas, they were wearing their mask. And um, then when they were in their private area, of course, they didn't have to do that, but they were operating in that safe manner. Um, I, I think that the difference too is that when people are living outside of the residential program, they, we don't necessarily know what's happening. Um, what kind of decisions they're making, but we know internally in the residential that all team members are wearing their mask. If there's personal care being given, it's full PPE. And so there's a little more parameters. Temperatures are being taken. Um, we do take temperatures when we're transporting people, but um, there's, I think that would be the difference. Okay, so ultimately, how do you make the decision between um, when and who you're going to support? And it, it, you've actually, you, you talked about the matrix. Um, and, and I guess the conversations with the person and the family, and I, I, I would imagine too, thinking about the person-centered plan and, and their goals and, and what have you. Is there anything else you would take into consideration to determine who you'd support? Um, so one of the things, is, I think the biggest thing is, is um, really hearing the person and the family. Um, and sometimes those are a little different. And I'll give you an example. Um, we have, um, a woman who has continued to work during this um, pandemic and she's older she does have underlying health conditions and there were team members and she works at a distribution center with food um, and there were team members and family members that were really concerned about her continuing to work during this time and because of her ability to physically distance um, um, so we pulled together very quickly and did some inf informed decision making with the family as well as with her and the team members. And at the end of the day, everybody agreed that this woman um, was very clear that she wanted to continue to work. This was what she wanted to do, why she wanted to do it. She understood the risks and she was willing to work on the physical distancing piece. And the employer was involved in that, in those conversations too. So they were also um, a part of that process and really valued her as an employee and were willing to kind of work with her. And so she's continuing to work to this day. And um, we had a little bit of a scare a while ago, that it wasn't anything, um, but it, it's about individual decisions. And we may not always agree, but if we can come to, just come to the table and have the conversation and hear each other. Yeah, so, and does that um, apply in the residential setting as well? So are families at this point able to visit with folks that you serve residentially? So we never stopped visitation. Um, now, people weren't coming into the, into the house, 
Um, okay. But if people wanted to visit, um, in the beginning, it was through the window, right? And then it right. was on the porch. Right. Um, right. And um, also virtually. I mean, that was, I think that is one thing we've learned through this is that we should have been doing that all the time, right? Because we have a lot of family members who aren't local. And so I, and I think about that for myself, like my kids live on the East Coast or West Coast. I'm on the East Coast, um, West Coast. And we never did virtual that and now we're using it all the time and i think yeah, that is one yeah. thing that we've learned in residential that there's ways to connect with brothers and sisters um nephews and nieces um, that are video and are much more meaningful than a phone conversation right, and right. so we never we never stopped visits now um okay. we did stop people going away with their family um mm -hmm. because of the risk and then we opened that back up a little bit um kind of person by person and right. made okay. decisions on who they were living with and then if, if they, when they came back were they able to wear the mask for two weeks while they were in the common areas and so it really was individualized by the person so at this time families aren't able to visit in the home nor is the person allowed to visit outside of the home and back to the family's home um we correct? are out of our quarantine um we have so we are two weeks past our last quarantine so we have um on monday um have allowed people allowed i don't like that word but have worked with families who want to see their um, son or daughter to um go home so we're working on some weekend visitations this weekend yay Right. Yeah, that's great news. Yeah. I know that I know I know families. I, I'm in that same boat, and I, I can't wait to be able to see our daughter. And I know she can't wait to be able to be with us. So that that's great yeah. news. What about day and employment? Um, if you talk a little bit about whether or not staff will be quarantined two weeks before um, someone you support begins to be supported again by your staff, um, and what it get, and you've talked briefly about expectations around the PPE. Um, for the person, staff, and family, if there are any. So staff do not, are not quarantined for two weeks before they support somebody. Um, we do have a person who is um, choosing to come into the residential program and they are not able to be tested. So they're gonna quarantine at home for a couple of weeks um, before they come in um, with their um, roommates. Um, so that was a team decision that they decided that was the um, compromise was the quarantine for two weeks okay. and the temperature checks. But um, day employment in regards to staff being um, quarantined for two weeks, that's not happening. Um, our groups that are in the community right now are really small. So if, for example, we have a town called Aberdeen. If you live in Aberdeen and you're somebody who wants um, to have an hour or two of community supports, then you might be with two or three at the most other people and you kind of plan what that day looks like. Cause there's not a lot open right now, but it's been fascinating to see what people are choosing to do with that time. Sometimes they're just sitting around a picnic table and, and yeah. spending time with each other. We talk about yeah. safety. Um, safety is yeah. really important, but that connection, what we learned is, you know, that this is good i mean virtually but there's something about sitting around um in a park somewhere just being able to see people and interact in that way that has um, been very um impactful for people we support okay wonderful so you know i've asked of this of nick and bernie spoke to it too but um from whom is the arc receiving their guidance and i i think we could probably all guess but go ahead yeah I mean, CDC, of course, um, our health yeah. department, DDA, um, every, I mean, all of this information and, and you know, it changes, right? So it's not like, oh, this is what I learned two weeks ago and that's how I'm making my decisions. It is literally every day. I have somebody checking the CDC website every day um, and then giving us what those guidelines are. And we have a toolkit that we put together for all of our staff members that, um, so if you're a direct support professional, you can access this toolkit that tells you exactly what you need to you know, be aware of. This is our practice. Um, like we just implemented like CPR, like what happens during this pandemic if somebody needs CPR? And yeah. so we put some guidelines out on what we know right now. Um, but I think it's the idea of not resting on what we know now. And as, as Nick said earlier, it's the science and um, just being really um, clear that we don't know all the information and we're going to have to pivot as necessary. 
so what are some of the things you've learned? <laughs> What's uh, work? I feel like <laughs> um, let me see. What have we? We've learned that um, I had a. This is. I'm going to tell you something that a mom said. She called me probably a month into this, and she was doing um, a porch visit. And because she, mom has some underlying health conditions, and so she's not able to take her daughter home. And she called me one day and she said, you know, I've always worried about what's going to happen to my daughter when I die. Right? That's every parent's, you know, every parent's it worry. Is. And she said, what I learned during this pandemic is that my daughter is much more resilient than I ever thought she was and that she understands more about what's happening. And um, she said, you know, when I left, I thought she was going to be upset that I wasn't taking her. And she was like, bye, mom. <laughs> you know, yeah. but I think that's the most profound thing is that we've learned things about people we support and p ourselves, right? We've, we've learned yeah. things that um, we didn't know before, or we just had our blinders on or a person is a certain person because that's always the way we've done. And that's always how we've supported them. Mm -hmm. And people are asking for different things and, um, and wanting different things. So their wants have changed. Um, their needs have changed, but their wants have changed too. And yeah. so, um, yeah, I think the thing yeah, about I, just being open and learning. Yeah. And I, if you, I just like to add to that, I, that has been my own personal experience that of, of our daughter, that boy, she has grown, she's resilient. Um, I too feel that's, that's the big concern for all of us. What happens when we're gone? And what I've realized is that I can go. She's, she did just, she's doing just well. And, just fine and her staff really are very good <laughs> and they really are quite capable of supporting her well and um, so we've learned a great deal um, through all of this that's wonderful it's great Mary. well let me um, um, so let me ask you, I got a couple more questions for you what if a person that you are supporting um, through the art gets upset about their staff wearing a mask does the does the staff have to wear the mask Yes, okay. they do have to wear the mask. Um, that is, I mean, it's interesting um, that in the beginning of all this, staff would say, well, you know, maybe I don't need to wear it because so-and-so. I actually believe at the end of the day, um, the people we supported were um, much more comfortable with people wearing the mask than maybe the staff were about wearing the mask. Um, now, there were some people we supported that, um, you know, we had to do some, you know, social stories about why a person is wearing a mask now this isn't a doctor's office you know but this is why um we've also chosen to use different type of masks depending on um the person we might be supporting um so we do have a few people who require want the masks that have um you can see their mouth yeah um and then also what we learned is that the people we were supporting were also saying well if my staff are wearing a mask my team then i want to wear a mask so that became kind of you know, that was a natural kind of thing. Well, if they're wearing one, I want to wear one. And then we've had to be creative um, for some people, um, the type of mask, because um, we do have one person in particular who will wear, but he has like this hat. I call it like a bee suit, um, yeah. but he, it's a hat. So we've just been very creative. Team members have been really creative in trying to help people maneuver through this. Wonderful. Well, let me ask you this finally, what can, um, what would you say, what would you recommend to family um, about how they can help their family member prepare for the new expectations around COVID, wearing masks, washing hands, physically distancing, what would you recommend they do? Just practice those things, even in the home, um, in the, when you have family members over, when you go to the grocery store, um, even if it's just for a short period of time, just try different things um and you know be creative and then bring other people sometimes you know i think about like if i were to ask my daughter to do something but my neighbor could ask her to do the same thing and it would come it would go off a lot different right and so <laughs> right, um, right right just right. being open to if this isn't working then try to figure it out but i think the social stories when i think about like we use some videos about wearing a mask people you know how to take them on and off um the videos seem to have also had a big impact and peers. Yeah. Yes. Peers yes, yes. Them, seeing that yeah. it's that's happening. So yeah. 
Well, finally, any last thoughts for families in terms of best ways to communicate with staff? Well, that's another thing, Marianne, that I think that I've learned is that um, the collaboration with families um, during this time um, has been, we tend to have a lot of conversation with our families who are in the residential program because it's that's just what happens. Yeah. But I've yeah. also noticed that in the meaningful day, there has been a lot more um, participation conversations that we're having with families in understanding what their what their needs are. And we don't have all the answers, um, but like you know, we, Nick said it like coming together and just having those conversations is important. Um, we have a button on our website, so when our case managers call and they don't know the answer, they're like, "You can submit it to the CEO, or they'll just they'll just tell me what the I question is." I love that. I love that. One. And I've gotten a few of those, and this, and a few of those have really led to some different outcomes um, for families and people. So oh, wonderful. Well, Sean, thank you again for being here and sharing all of this this information with us today. It's so appreciated. And with Thanks, that, Sarah. before we oh, you're welcome. Um, before we move on to Kim, I just need to forewarn folks. There normally we're finished by one, but my sense is that we might run over by maybe five to ten minutes. So know that um, because we want to provide folks with opportunity to ask questions at the end, but please feel free, obviously, to, to, to leave the, the webcast. All right, so with that, we're gonna round off this conversation with Kim Marchman. Um, welcome, Kim. Kim is a parent and um, we're gonna begin. Um, I'm gonna ask Kim to tell us a little bit about your family. Well, thank you for, part for asking me to participate and I'm happy to tell you about my family. My husband, Mark, and I have been married since the dinosaurs. Our son, Andrew, is 29. He's been dating his girlfriend, Michelle, and like I'm pointing to the pictures I, um, for five years now. Our Katie is 22, and Alexandria, or Alex, is 19. Um, we have somebody added to our family, but I'll tell you about that later. But so then we, we have a lot of family members. Um, and you can see there's there's a lot of us. And and that was all before COVID. So then we talk about last May and Katie, she graduated, woohoo, finished school at age 21. And you can see the, the crowd at the bottom. She had a lot of people come to her graduation. Um, she's lucky to have so many people love and support her. Now, as a family, we have used charting the life course tools in the past. And we did so again when we were planning Katie's good life as an adult. And I have to say, Katie's Katie's in it with us. Um, I say we and it's all the family. Now, we were thrilled when the ARC Northern Chesapeake region began personal supports for Katie. Um, Katie loved the staff's supervisor, but had a little bit of a rough time with her staff um, until Christine. And Christine worked 40 hours a week to support Katie during the day. And they played bingo, went swimming, watched cute boys play basketball, went shopping. <laughs> they had fun in the community. And this was every day. So... Katie and Christine are out and about during the day. Well, Katie also received some night support from another program. Um, we went through numerous staff there too um, until Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is the one who wound up moving in with us before COVID. Um, this was before she had to go to boot camp and she became a part of our family. And so in these pictures, you can see the three of us helped Katie get ready for prom. You know, Elizabeth was, li was living with us. We did her hair. Katie met and hung out with two cute boys. And Christine was texting us through the night, you know, send pictures and what's going on. And you can see that Katie, you know, is very well supported. She's really happy. And Elizabeth and Christine, um, th they talked and Katie benefited. Yeah. And then, and then COVID, how did this affect Katie and your family? Well, really in a blink of an eye, we no more Sunday family dinners, no festivals, no car trips, no restaurants, no cousins, families, friends, movies, Ravens, Christine and Andrew, brother Andrew. Andrew was coming over every Saturday 
and they would watch soccer together first and then they would do things together um alex was, still, alex was still in california for her internship we had no idea when she was going to get home um katie blamed me for covid uh she was really angry at me for a long time because i'm the one who said you know no andrew can't come over no you can't go swimming no the pool's not open no miss christine um you know she's not he here and and i want to add something to this and that's a quote that andrew said um and it's i think it's a pretty powerful one so back in april he said you know mom the whole world has the same fear now that i've always had and i'm mm -hmm. like what are you talking about andrew and he said i could get a family member sick and it could kill them and that's just so powerful from a sibling perspective to have that forever you know with yeah. having somebody who's medically fragile and then yeah. so i was telling you how it was bad well then it got worse yeah. um Katie, katie's great grandma my grandma passed away our dog mm. passed away snickers oh. our other two dogs got depressed my mom had a heart transplant and oh elizabeth left her boot camp so then our house got crazy um, Katie had a lot of behaviors and some of them were trash in the house. She wouldn't eat at a table anymore. She became a couch potato and I knew I needed help. And so I reached out and I think that was one of the smartest things I did was reaching out for help because, you know, I kept thinking, oh, I can do it. I can do it all. But we, we couldn't, we couldn't do it all. And then Monday, June 15th, what an awesome day. Um, Christine is back and she's back for katie with her personal supports and thank you thank you thank you again to the arc um we we we're having these personal supports and it's just such a tremendous help to us um we're you can't believe how much of a positive reaction it's it's been to our whole family can you give us some examples well, sure so christine is working 40 hours a week and she takes Katie out in public five hours a week. They go to parks, sometimes the pool and car rides help. You, you can see Katie yeah. jumped in the car and Max, the big dog, tried to go with her. We had to get Max out. Kate likes when she Kate likes to have Max cause trouble. Um, my husband and I both work from home and we were now able to work. Katie likes to play in the sprinkler and take a bath and she can take two baths a day and, and that's okay. Um, it, Katie goes out and, and if you see, go to the next slide. Um, so what's going on now? Yeah. So we're working on, um, social distancing and masks and I, you know, I pause because we need a lot more practice. We really do. Um, Katie wants to hug her family members. We we had to keep a fence in between Andrew and Michelle. The first time Katie saw them, she tried so hard to get them. Oh, um, yeah. we, we wash our hands constantly. There are temperatures taken throughout the day. Um, hand sanitizers are new best friend. Um, yeah. I even spray people with Lysol. I mean, I, you know, we're, we're really, we're really working hard. Um, I trust Christine and she, I know she's not going out in public, um, except grocery store shopping. She's not going to bars or, you know, she's very careful. Um, we don't have our evening help right now, uh, because it's difficult to trust somebody. Uh, when you, when you think about it, um, we're trusting them with Kate's life and we just fear for her safety and her and to be medically compromised and we're gonna start then again but it just takes a lot of conversations yeah and not not easy conversations at all by any stretch of the imagination so with that um kim let me ask you um what would you what what would you recommend um that that families begin to think about as they prepare for their family members to re-enter the community so that is such an extensive list and and i'm i'm gonna start i'm gonna go through and um uh, i'm gonna have a handout with this too because there's so many things and, and it starts first with practice wearing a mask have family family members staff or friends take pictures of themselves wearing the mask 
have um, family member, friends, staff, everybody reach out to online um, platforms with them in the mask talking. You know, wear the masks in the house. Make the mask the new normal. Get creative. You know what? You know, you were talking about the bee hat. There's other things you can do. Can you put the mask on a ball cap if they like that? Um, my mom sends pictures of Larry, the, her cane, wearing a mask to help Kate with, with the masks. Um, we practice hand sanitizer all day, all the time. Um, we practice hand washing. We use different yeah. sinks and different people assist. Um, we, we have a protocol for coming in our house and you take off your shoes, you use hand sanitizer, you change your clothes and then you wash your hands again. And you know, it, it, it can seem cumbersome, but that's our, our family policy. Um, you know, with social distancing, you can actually take something lightweight, even a stick or, you know, a string or something and take that with you to say, you know, this is six feet. This is how far we should be. You need to use schedules. They need to be words and pictures, and they be, need to be now when you're in the home and then going out. Um, talk, talk, talk some more. Talk to everybody. Um, there should be no surprises for the individual who's getting services. They need to know everything that's going on. And then here's what we were saying, those difficult conversations. You have to ask your staff, how do they protect themselves? You have to share your expectations for the staff, you know, to explain. We're trusting you with our family member's life and you need to be that blunt. It's their life. Um, date things like we're also trusting that you're wearing a mask and don't participate in dangerous activities like going to parties or hanging out with 20 people in your house. And, and these are really tough conversations and it takes trust. And that's where, you know, we knew Christine and it's gonna be tough to build that new relationship, but for, Katie's benefit and, and for her to have that good life, we have to do that. And you need to anticipate the possible behaviors that are gonna happen when you go out and then plan ahead before anybody leaves the house. You need to go out with the staff and your family member at first if possible, because there's this is new. You need to model all the behaviors. Start small. Remember, for every step forward, there might be a step back or two and it's okay. You have to ask for help when you need it. Um, don't overwhelm yourself uh, or your family member <laughs> or your staff. Now, I gave you this like whole long list. And right, I'm like, right, oh, right, 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 yeah. Don't overwhelm. <laughs> but, you know, everything doesn't have to happen in one day, but it's things to think about and consider. Um, so this is a picture of the other night when Katie drank her first beer. She loved it. Um, and I just have to say to remember, even in this time of stress and confusion, to to be healthy, to be happy, and to have some fun. Kim, thank you. I, you know, it's not easy to share your story. It's it's very personal and um, takes a lot of courage. And I'm just so grateful that that you have. I I think you've given families and individuals all kinds of good ideas and, and providers as well about how you might move forward and certainly conversations to have. So thank you and make sure you thank Katie and the rest of your family too for being willing to be <laughs> up oh, on the screen. They helped with all of it. They helped with everything. Ah, uh, well, make sure you thank them. And so with that, I, I again, I, I, I want to move to, I want to take this time to open it up for us to receive some questions. Again, we're now at 103. We'll go until 110. Um, we'll take the next seven minutes to take some questions. And um, we're fortunate to have Aaron, um, who's going to um, read the questions and field them for us. Aaron. Tor, hi everyone, and thank you for such a good discussion. And really, there's in the chat a number of comments about how much people have appreciated the conversation today. Um, I know there were some early questions about the handouts. It looks like those have been sorted out. If you had trouble in the beginning, um, do please try and download them again now. They should work for you, and Donna always sends them out again um, to everyone who attended as well. Um, one of the first questions that came in that I think is pretty interesting is, what are you doing with what you know now to prepare for a second wave if there is one in the fall or winter? Erin, who would you like to address that? 
that's a you know, provider? Honestly, I, I feel like that really it, it could be a question for anyone on the panel. Um, because really, whether you're a system, you're a provider, you're a family member, we're all thinking about what the future might look like and how we get ready for that. So this is Bernie. I'll respond to that. I think that um, some of the comments earlier, and I think Sean Cross might have said this, uh, as well as Kim and Nick, uh, that, you know, we learn something new every day. Uh, you cannot just rely on the current knowledge that you have. So, yeah. you know, the question is, is, is there a second wave? Uh, we don't know. Uh, would there be a, a spike within the first wave? I mean, that would look like a second wave uh, to me. And and so, again, I think staying uh, current with, you know, what is the advice from uh, our Department of Health for the state? Um, you know, what do we see with the executive uh, orders from the governor and, and the group, the task force that he has working on the pandemic? They're advising him. Um, what do we do with within our department talking to the public health division? Then those are the epidemiologists um, who basically reviewed our uh, guidance that we sent out for considerations for people. So I think that keeping our finger on the pulse and trying to stay as current as we can and continuing to uh, have discussions uh, similar to like today. I think uh, Kim's uh, presentation about families and was was very enlightening. I mean, as you said, Aaron, uh, a lot of positive comments coming in. The, the things that uh, we heard from Sean today and from the webinars that uh, she has uh, done uh, a few weeks ago with DDA. Um, I also want to remind people that, you know, we, we at DDA uh, have been doing the webinars, if you have not been on them every Friday for a long period of time, and then we just started doing them every other week, and they are on our website. And so, you know, you can go back and look at, you know, what did we talk about? We had, had uh, Dr. Fetter from um, the Center for Disease Control present with us uh, three or four times. Uh, as well as a couple of nurses, or, or at least one nurse from, from the public health uh, segment uh, to talk about PPE and how to wear PPE, et cetera. So, so again, um, you know, without going on any longer, I think, again, it's keeping current and then being able to forecast, if we can, uh, what the needs are. I mean, the, the issue with PPE initially, with the shortages when the pandemic started, et cetera, uh, we at DDA have been fortunate enough to get PPE, to get it out to uh, providers, to families, to people self-directing, uh, et cetera, with masks and gloves and gowns. Uh, we've gotten at least four orders out, and we have another order uh, that went in on the 15th, and we'll see when that will be delivered to the regional offices and, again, being able to assist people. Thank you, Bernie. Okay, folks, we're at 107, um, just about 108, so we're going to move forward. I want to draw your attention to the resource slide and the two resources that Bernie um, um, spoke about earlier are included here. Um, this is, is part of your PowerPoint that you'll receive um, in your packet. Um, and then with that, I just want to thank you all for joining us today. I especially want to thank our guests, Bernie Simons, Nick Burton, Sean Cross, and Kimberly, Kimberly Marchman for, for sharing your time with us today, and Aaron for your help, and Patricia for your, for your help as well. And I, I hope you'll join us for our next webinar on September. The date is wrong. I apologize. The new date will be out shortly on um, transitioning. No, it is September 2nd. I apologize. Transition 2. Thank you and, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Yeah.